I really mean thank you for having me. This happens to be the third talk on artificial intelligence and decision support technologies that I'm giving at UNC this month. So I, I think you call that a turkey. So uh, as I thought about what I wanted to talk about today, uh, how to structure the discussion, uh, I landed on the, the topic, who watches the machines? Uh, I am a technologist by background. Uh, I'm a former CTO, entrepreneur, uh, computer scientist by background. So I inherently believe in the promise of technology. I, I think that through the wise application of information technology, we really can achieve triple aim kinds of goals. But it has to be done very carefully. And that's especially true as we move into this new realm of you know, some of the, the novel types of data that we're going to be absorbing, and especially artificial intelligence. We'll get into that in just a minute. So uh, quick note on structure. Um, we originally said we we're going to save 10 minutes at the end. My challenge to all of you is jump in and interrupt and ask questions as we go. Uh, we will manage the time. We may skip around. Um, I'd much rather have the discussion live while we're, while we're on the subject. Uh, very quickly, the topics that we're going to go through, first of all, the data dilemma. So we're going to talk about what is happening with our technologies, what's happening with the rapid rise of EMRs, what's happening with all the new data sources that we have coming in. Uh, we're going to dive into artificial intelligence because that is uh, really profound. Um, I am not, I'm a bit of a technology skeptic. Um, in spite of that, I think artificial intelligence is absolutely going to be transformative for our industry. I wouldn't say that about a lot of other hyped technologies right now. And then finally, who watches the machines? So how can we wisely manage these new technologies and deploy them in ways that are productive and avoid some of the mistakes that we've made with technology in the past? So first of all, just to say the obvious, um, we have electronic health records. This is a new thing. Uh, 2008, uh, we had about 9% penetration of uh, basic electronic health records according to the Office of the National Coordinator. Uh, we're sitting at about 95, 96% today. So all of a sudden we have this incredible data capture tool, but also this tool to steer our frontline delivery system into the best paths, the, you know, the best practices that we know about the practice of healthcare. But it has to be done carefully. There are successes. There's a lot of bashing of electronic health records and how they interrupt and take a lot of time, but there are successes out there in the world. We've got one from uh, uh, Mercy Hospital St. Louis. And, and Mercy, if you don't know, a uh, fairly large system, great system for quality, uh, very well respected, good user of technology. Uh, they are an epic shop. Uh, seven years ago, they undertook a program to put uh, clinical protocols, uh, digital clinical protocols, in place in their epic install. Uh, they put about 40 of them in place over a few years. Uh, this is their protocol for heart failure. And coming into things, they had a mortality rate of 6% for heart failure presenting at, the, at their hospitals. Um, they targeted a number of metrics that had explicit goals that they were going after. Certainly mortality, uh, a couple of process measures, things like time to diuretic, uh, reduction in variable cost per case, uh, certainly efficiency and financial sustainability was part of this. And very briefly, the results that they've gotten were, were actually pretty promising. They got the mortality down to under 2% from 6%. Uh, national average is about 5%, so that's pretty dramatic. Uh, they also, they save about $800 uh, per heart failure patient uh, simply by, by streamlining and standardizing uh, their, their care pathways. And that equates to about $28 million in direct variable savings across the 40 pathway, pathways that they deployed over two years. So this was a triple aim win. It is quality improving, presumably patient experience improving, and certainly cost saving. But that's not typical. If you look at uh, really kind of the median clinical decision support implementation out in the world today, uh, false positives are the name of the game. Uh, there are massive distractions to the point that in many systems they're often ignored. Uh, clinical decision support has actually given electronic health records as a whole a bit of a black eye. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is a blinded example. We're not going to be in the hospital. But, um, Looking at uh, sepsis, uh, ED sepsis detection, this particular hospital had, uh, they were able to detect in an audit about a 0.3% rate of clinicians actually reacting to an alert that's fired in their clinical decision support system. So 99.7% of the time, it's just noise. So that is uh, arguably, that is quality of care reducing. Uh, that is a distraction, that is valuable time that is being taken away from clinicians, and that is typical. We, we very often see in these types of studies about a 99% ignore or override rate. And the problem is going to get worse. 
because we have this incredible new set of data sources that are banging on the door trying to get into our health systems. Uh, and that is uh, it's a lot of different things, but it's better integration with all of our partners through the community, both medical partners and non-medical partners. Uh, it's environmental data. All of our devices are starting to talk about where they are and what they're doing and whether or not they've been maintained, uh, things like that. Uh, we've got genomics. Uh, that is a whole incredible field, you know, really all of the omics, a whole incredible field of new data. We know that it's predictive, we know that it's valuable, it is overwhelming. Uh, we've got clinical surveillance, public health agencies are putting information out about what's in circulation, what's going on. And then finally, we've got all these little spies that we're putting on the patients, uh, things like uh, digital watches and all kinds of patient monitors. So if you put yourself in the shoes of a frontline clinician, and I know that we've got some clinicians in the room, what do you do with all this data? Because you're, you're probably overwhelmed with the patients that you're already seeing, the data that's already being presented in the OMR. And that's where these technologies come in. So I'd argue that the goal of clinical decision support, the goal of artificial intelligence, is really to, to augment all of our frontline decision makers. It's, it's to help them make better decisions and to watch over these rivers of data that are flowing through our systems and really just bring to their attention the things that, that really need action, that really need a decision on their part. And that really brings us to our second section. Uh, we do have some, some case studies in here. This is where I really love people to jump in and ask those ethical questions. There are ethical implications, but I'm not going to get you over the head with them, so please jump in. So uh, artificial intelligence, the, the big question that I've always asked, uh, a little bit less and less, is, is really, are we there yet? Because this is a field you know, for, for clinical decision support for replicating some human thought processes that has been around since the 50s. And frankly, not a whole lot has happened since the 50s. There hasn't been that much productive use of artificial intelligence. So I'm going to argue that we are there. And we've, uh, we've mentioned Google. I'm going to jump right into uh, something that Google has done outside of healthcare recently. Uh, Google's DeepMind unit uh, out in London. Uh, they took on the problem of chess. And we've been able to beat human grandmasters in chess with computers for quite a while. IBM did it with Deep Blue decades ago. Um, but if you look at what Google's done, Google took a framework, uh, it's called AlphaZero, it's a general purpose artificial intelligence framework. It is not a purpose-built chess bot. And they gave it the rules of chess, and they gave it a little referee process that helped it have some sense of whether or not it was doing a good job in the chess game, and they just let it play chess. They, they didn't show it any previous games of chess. They didn't give it libraries of you know, previous Grandmasters games, things like that. They just let it play chess. So we've got a little graph of its performance learning in the, uh, the upper left there. And if you look at, we've got this, this vertical red line here just past the 100 mark. That is the point where DeepMind is estimated to have surpassed the skill of Gary Kasparov, who was the, uh, the Grandmaster that Deep Blue, IBM's Deep Blue, was able to beat. It was about one hour into DeepMind's chess playing career. One hour of soft top play could be a grandmaster. And about four hours in, it surpassed the world reigning chess bot Sockfish. So this is an incredibly powerful level of self-taught learning. Um, this, is not, you know, this is not the meticulous, painstaking wiring of protocols that we've done in some of our previous learning systems. Uh, if you've been paying attention, uh, kind of interesting, just uh, I believe it was two weeks ago, Google has pulled the subunit of their DeepMind group called DeepMind Health that is responsible for healthcare. They have pulled it out of the DeepMind organization and into the mainstream Google. And they've said that they are doing that specifically because they believe that the technology is ready and they want to commercialize it at a rapid clip. And DeepMind is a little bit more of a research-oriented organization. So you could ask, what does this have to do with healthcare? I mean, chess is a very mathematical game. So let's play a game of radiology. Uh, this is research that came out of Stanford. I was spoke with Dr. Matt Longbridge, who was the principal investigator on this project. Uh, basically, Stanford Health and Stanford Computer Science got together and tried to see how good a radiologist they could build. Uh, they used a library of about, of about 112,000 um, chest x-rays, and they threw a, an artificial intelligence machine learning framework at it, and uh, those, those x-rays had been annotated for 14 common pathologies, so things like pneumonia. And they basically let it, let it grind, let it try to figure out how to diagnose pneumonia in these, these 14 diseases. 
And after four weeks, uh, they had an algorithm that could outperform a control group of four practicing Stanford radiologists on 14 out of 14 conditions. So it's beating the radiologists at their own game. Uh, a couple of things to point out about this. The progress that we've seen in artificial intelligence has really been on what we call narrow AI, or very task-oriented artificial intelligence. It's extremely narrowly focused. Uh, there was an algorithm in that group of 14 that could diagnose pneumonia, but if you showed a picture of a dog or a bicycle, it has no idea what it's looking at. In fact, it may diagnose pneumonia in that bicycle. <laughs> um, so they have blinders on. They are very, very good at exceptionally narrow tasks. They can completely fall apart when presented with information that they are unfamiliar with. So anyone see any pitfalls there? Anywhere that things can go off the rails? Uh, it's happened. It's happened with Watson Health. Uh, this has been, there's been a lot of uh, criticism in the news of Watson Health and their ability to transfer the knowledge that they've learned at one organization to another, and this is one of the underlying problems. Um, there's also a challenge in this brought up in the ability to explain what's going on inside these algorithms. Um, they're, they're inscrutable in many cases. They, they are extraordinarily complex on the inside. You can't really ask what they're doing. And in fact, uh, Dr. Lundgren was talking about another study of head CTs uh, that he was involved in. And they developed an algorithm that was diagnosing things out of head CTs, uh, very similar to this. And they developed a heat map that helped the algorithm to show what it was looking at as it was coming to its conclusion. It couldn't really explain its reasoning in the way that a radiologist could, but it could at least show you what parts of the image it was looking at. And one of the things that they found with the head CTs was it was identifying the placement of two screws in the head brace as predictive of disease or not disease. So they went back and they looked at the study design, and it turns out that in the course of the study, they had a bunch of head CTs they needed to augment their stone cold normal population, patients that had absolutely nothing going on with them, so they ran some more patients. They found some subjects, and I don't know how you do that for head CTs, but apparently you can. Uh, they ran some more patients. In between, someone had swapped out the head brace. And it was a very similar model, but a slightly newer iteration, and two screws had each moved by a millimeter. And the algorithm said, I'm told to predict disease. I see a little change that indicates no disease. I'm going to use that. So the ability to explain what these algorithms are doing under the covers is absolutely essential. Because as we think about, these are algorithms that can replicate bias. They look at what is happening. They, they are told the right answer, quote, the right answer and they will replicate it. So they replicate bias in the system and they will cheat. They will use, uh, I, I love the quote from Dr. Longworth, I treat these as lazy residents. They're not dumb, but they're gonna use every trick that they can find to avoid doing any hard work and get the best score that they can. They cheat. Now, speaking of bias, uh, we've got an example here from multi-care health system. We're moving outside the clinical realm. Clinical, you know, clinical is difficult from an ethical perspective because these are life and death decisions. You know, this is very high stakes. So we see a lot of activity in administrative areas, and uh, multi-care health system up in Washington is a great example of that. Uh, multi-care had a severe problem with turnover, and especially in their nursing staff. Uh, and this is really pervasive around most of the country that it's very hard to get and keep nurses right now. So they brought in specialists. Uh, uh, HR assessment company called Arena.io. They, they specifically focus on healthcare recruiting. And they have applicants, um, they both look at everything that an applicant would normally submit, and they also take applicants through a brief, it's kind of a 15 or 20 minute um, assessment that they provide. And they come back with a score that is basically that individual's fitness for a specific role. And it is very specific to the role. If you score someone against you know, UNC in one unit versus UNC in another unit or another facility, it's actually very likely that they'll come out with a different score. Uh, they've been very successful. Uh, they use this as really just a, an indicator or a guidance in the hiring process. Uh, but they've actually been able to cut their nurse turnover at 180 days by 40%. So pretty dramatic, pretty big benefit to the health system. That certainly has benefits. I and mean, if you spend less money on recruiting expenses, uh, you have more predictable staff levels, and you have more experienced and engaged staff as a result of that. So there's no question that there are benefits from cutting turnover. It is good for everyone. But you've got to ask, this is a system that is looking at history. It's looking at who has been successful in that unit, in that role in the past. If there is bias in that human system, if there are people of whatever backgrounds that are being discriminated against and are therefore unsuccessful 
unhappy and leaving, it will replicate those biases. It will tell you that they are not going to be successful. So we need to be very careful about what feeds into these algorithms. What are they allowed to look at? They will, they will cheat. They will deduce anything that they can. If they're allowed to see zip codes, if they're allowed to see neighborhoods, and if they can deduce something about who that person might be from that information, they will do it. They're very clever. And that really brings us to an ethical puzzle around explainability with these algorithms. All right, so I um, haven't had any questions. I'm a little disappointed in you all. Um, we'll, we'll say, yes? So the one on the retention of nurses, so you've got this fit between whatever the culture, whatever those, and they've got a population that's feeding in. Does that not, would that not have the potential to inhibit the culture of the organization from changing to be able to keep because they're getting it's, what they're what they're paying for it's, yes versus yes and so you got what you get versus maybe some things need to change to keep other people there and and there were a few things that you know there were a few things that we talked about along exactly those lines um, with multi care and with uh, arena we spoke to we spoke to a couple of their customers we spoke to multi care we spoke to to arena themselves. Um, one is you do attempt to blind the algorithms to some of the information that you don't want them to see. You, you don't give them race if you don't want them to look at race. They may still find ways to deduce race. Uh, they, they are you know, truly very clever and tricky. Um, but the other thing is you use some of the classic uh, human resources approaches uh, to managing that bias problem that you expect in a fair system overall that your pool of hires should reflect the distribution of your pool of applicants on average. So if people are being cut out, you know, it, it's hard to say on an individual case basis, but if you have a pool of applicants that doesn't look like the pool of people that you hire, you have a bias problem in your hiring process. I'll mention that um, right in Tacoma is an out of startup doing uh, ethics, doing explainable machine learning. In, in, in that, right there. Yes. So I'm wondering if there's a, a connection. So I, I don't recall where, I, I don't believe that Arena is based in Tacoma, and Arena was the technology provider in this case, but there, there are several around. There's actually, there's one in the triangle area that's doing explainable AI as well. This is one of the most active areas of research in artificial intelligence right now, is, is trying to get to a balance where these algorithms will never be able to explain themselves perfectly. They're, they're too complicated under the covers, but to at least give a, a rough sense, and I'll, I'll give an example of that in just a minute. I, I heard the speaker they actually give this nearly the same talk to in philosophy, colloquia, as well as uh, AI. So I was impressed with their philosophical depth. I think that the, uh, I suspect that the, the field of philosophy is on fire right now as a, as a result of uh, all of these artificial intelligence advances. So, one more in back. Yeah, so um, with the example you gave for the emergency in St. Louis Hospital, um, that seems to be like an, a successful example of the clinical pathway. Um, was that also an algorithm as well? Or? Well, that was, a, that was more of a hardwired algorithm. So that was something that, that human researchers came up with, you know, evidence-based medicine, but then they hardwired their rules. And I'll give you an example of an artificial intelligence one in just a minute. It's very, very similar. Um, all right, so just, just very quickly, uh, as we've just gone into it, thank you for leading the conversation. Um, explainability is one of the most active areas of research in artificial intelligence right now for exactly these issues. It is difficult to roll out these algorithms and trust that they're correct and trust that they're doing what we want ethically unless you can have some understanding of what's happening under the covers. But there are differing views on this uh, and they, they actually come from an ethical perspective. Uh, I spoke to uh, Mike Wall, who's the Chief Analytics Officer at the University of Chicago Medicine. Uh, he's a clinician. Uh, he says, uh, it is hard to blindly trust these from a clinical perspective when we cannot understand what's going on under the, under the covers. And you can understand that. He has a, a position of, you know, do no harm, protect the patient's safety. If he doesn't understand a tool, he has a difficult time advocating for it. But on the other hand, you spoke to uh, Nathan Shaw, who's a, um, uh, he's a, a noted AI researcher out at Stanford. And he basically said, if it's effective, you know, if, if we apply the same standard of double-blinded A-B testing, randomized controlled trials to these algorithms, if they work, 
what right do we have to withhold them from medicine? We don't have to understand what's going on. And that is true of a lot of, a lot of our lab tests, a lot of our drugs. We don't really understand how they work under the covers, or at least the typical person who uses them doesn't. So there's, there's a balance there of, you know, of, of benefit versus ability to, to defend, to understand what it's actually doing. And an organization, you know, to the point about um, clinical decision support, an organization that I think has actually found that, that balance pretty well, um, Intermountain Healthcare, you know, of course, they're, they're often cited, they're out in front on a lot of topics. They've been doing digital uh, care pathways, clinical protocols for more than 20 years now. Um, we spoke with uh, their head of pulmonology, who was responsible for a reboot of their pneumonia diagnosis in the emergency department protocol. And uh, they developed a new protocol. It is based on machine learning. Uh, so first of all, it looks at a lot of these new data sources. It wants to know everything that it can about a patient. It wants to know everything coming out of the radiology systems. Uh, but the way that that's manifested, the way that it's an evaluation of whether or not a patient has pneumonia is ultimately manifested to the doctors is very subtle. You get this, this little colored square that pops up in the chart. It's never interruptive. But the clinicians have partnered well enough with the informatics teams over the years that when they see that clinical decision support system light up, they know that there's a very good chance that it's right. It's telling them something important and valuable and correct that at least deserves their consideration. So they've, they've really been very diligent about not creating alert fatigue. Now, when you mouse over that, that little key that indicates pneumonia right there, you get a bunch of information. First of all, uh, what do you think? You know, I think that this patient has pneumonia with 89% probability, and I don't see it on the chart. But second of all, why? I think that because their pulse is elevated, their temperature is up, and they had a surgery in another facility four days ago that has an outbreak of pneumonia. And I actually have the microbiology data on that pneumonia. I believe that it's probably drug-resistant hospital-acquired pneumonia. And given this patient's overall acuity and risk, I'm actually going to recommend that you jump to the second-line antibiotic because they're prob the, the bug is probably resistant to the first line. So they've gone very, very deep. They treat the algorithm as a partner, but they still require it to explain itself because it doesn't have all the context. It has blind spots. And there are times where absolutely clinically appropriately, a clinician is going to look at that and say, no, I understand what's going on. I know better. I'm going to disregard and override. So I think they've, they've struck a good balance. They, they can at least give the major factors that are leading into, uh, into that, that recommendation. So I've got just a couple of, uh, couple of minutes and, and a couple of slides on how to do this effectively. But yeah. Um, so a lot of the things you've talked about are in the kind of inpatient acute setting. Yes. Right, where a lot of the data is sitting. Um, I'm kind of curious about if you've seen experience with more outpatient community-based settings and whether there's organizations that are willing to um, share the data with the patients and the consumers more directly. And if they are, why have they chosen to do that um, compared to maybe the traditional way of doing it? And, and has it made a difference in terms of any particular outcome? I'm not assuming that's happened, but I'm curious about it, it because it would be nice to prevent some of these things. Absolutely, right. absolutely. And, and yeah. full disclosure, I talk to health systems all day long, so I, I tend to have more of a health system perspective. Um, it is happening. It's happening in a lot of different ways. Uh, you know, promoting interoperability is going to open up, incrementally open up patient data and mandate that health systems actually open application programming interfaces, technical, technical doors that outside applications can come through to get a patient's data. Um, so that's, that's kind of one thing. Uh, we have, you know, we know that generally the, one of the big mega trends in healthcare right now is that we are pushing patients out of the hospitals as much as possible. We want procedures to happen to the extent that it's appropriate in ambulatory settings, and we want to keep them out in the world healthy as we transition to value-based care as opposed to fee-for-service. Uh, now, there are pockets of this being done with artificial intelligence. Uh, Epic is actually, they're putting out their care companion uh, care companion is really meant to be kind of a, a day in and day out. I'm not going into my chart on purpose. It's more, I see that you have an exercise and you have congestive heart failure and it would be really good if you could get out and take a little walk around the block. That would be great for you. And you agreed to do that with your doctor. It's on your goal list. So it's a little bit more of a companion for staying healthy as opposed to a, a chart access thing. Um, I know that, um, I can point to Intermountain again, they have an AI-based diabetes control um, 
really targeted at, it's, it's mostly targeted at young people who are transitioning to independent living. They're, they're moving out of their parents' house. Uh, it turns out that's a very dangerous time um, in a diabetic's life because their, all of their life habits are changing. They're, they're going to start cooking for themselves, hopefully. Um, so that's, that's an app that, that monitors everything that's going on and tries to help, kind of reminds them of the consequences of bad habits. Uh, and it's doing it through, you know, partly through some some artificial intelligence and machine learning they're using. Uh, two, two, two things. One, one is I noticed with the AB testing, sounds like it's real simple and controlled, but all of the the ambient environment is fluctuating as well. So unfortunately, that can be done with, with a honest confidence. Uh, uh, and Jenna at and all. Uh, how to kind of work that out, uh, but, but it, it's not the simple case. And secondly, from the possible pneumonia patient example you just presented, um, I would not assume that the attributes that appeared that in, that, in, the, in the suggestion for that patient are anywhere inside the model. I would bet my bottom dollar that, that these I should be separate predictions or sort of predicting the environment as well as the patient and then bringing it together. I mean, I, I, looking inside the algorithm, particularly constraining the algorithm development to things that could go in a world would fail for the, for the two, two effectiveness of the model. So constraining, sorry, I missed that last part. Constraining. Um, if, if, if you took all your suggestions for the, the things that had popped up and said that this is the universe of possible features that you could use in your model, then you would not like to get a good model from it. Well, and, and then you would think you could explain and say, oh, the only things in this model are these features that we might tell you about. That would, that's not going to apply. Well, it, it is incomplete. It, it, it's certainly incomplete. But one of the, you know, back to the arguments about effectiveness, um, the way that Intermountain rolled this out was ultimately uh, Dr. Nathan Dean, um, who you know, we, we spoke to, he was the lead on this project. He is the head of pulmonology for Intermountain. And he basically went in front of everybody and said, it's not perfect. It doesn't know everything that you know. There are a lot of cases where you need to override it. But on the whole, this is more accurate than you are. Um, I, I, I satisfied with that, I'd be alarmed if I discovered that just the collateral output that the model goes through its decision points in, to, from its own development and then and, and, and then provides these uh, that as explanation of the model. <coughs> and so the model should be is, is fixed, it's developed, it's frozen, and then and still a black box. And then a spectrum of, act of it, activities illuminate how it must be working, or some features about how it must. Be working. Right, and that and that's a that's a whole other session. I I'd, uh, I'd actually love to follow up on that, but I've got one last point that I want to leave you with here. Um, there, there's a, a metaphor that we've settled on for how to how to think about these decision support technologies that I, I think actually works pretty well, which is basically these technologies you, you have to treat them like junior staff. I mean, they're, they're, they do useful work, but they need to be overseen in the way that junior staff are. They need to be coached. They need to have explicit goals. You need to give them performance reviews on a regular basis, and you need to limit their authority. In the same way that you don't let a resident prescribe a controlled substance, you have to have someone else sign off on it. There are places where you need to, we call these circuit breaker rules. You need to put a limit on what the algorithm is allowed to do to limit potential harm, because they absolutely have blind spots. They are immature, they go off the rails. We've seen this in other industries. There are whole companies, uh, Knight Capital Hedge Fund, melted down in 20 minutes because they deployed a bad algorithm. They lost half a billion dollars in 20 minutes. So this is, uh, there is very real danger. It has to be managed carefully. And I think that's time. Yeah, thanks very much. Yeah.